Greetings, ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from, from Outer from Space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Story number one, Death Wilder's Perspective, written by Master Ficus. The Gotian were an adaptive species, if nothing else. Their planet was a mild climate, abundant with mineral wealth, low gravity, and hyperactive tectonic plates. Approximately one-third of the planet was a freshwater ocean, changing shape every few years. The shorelines were constantly hammered by tsunamis caused by endless underwater earthquakes. The land was scarred at the plate boundaries by escaping the lava, and mountains dominated the landscape. At the center of every plate was a more even landscape, usually dominated by lakes. Plants in the mountains were mostly moss and fungus base, in the fields where forests, grasslands, and crops were all massive root systems. Small predators and herbivores were unique to each haven between the plates, with birds the one and only exceptions. The Goatian were the other exception, resembling a cross between a mountain goat and an ape. They were fur-covered mammals and tough and semi-dexterous paws. They traversed between the small plates in small herds, having exceptional balance in the mountains and smart enough to find the safest routes across the changing landscape that wouldn't burn their hardened paws. Travel between plates was necessary for replenishable grazing, mating, and sharing of information between herds. As they advanced, the need to travel shifted from basic survival to trading and mating. Structures were designed to withstand the constantly shifting surfaces. Wars were fought between tribes, tools, and vehicles designed for moving mountains met the need. Communication towers were on the peaks of the shifting mountains, were marvels of engineering. When the first aircraft was created, it awakened equal parts desire and fear of something previously unknown. Stillness. In the air of Gotin couldn't feel the shifting of the planet, couldn't hear the falling of the rocks and boulders. They couldn't relax their balance. Their species united in this new goal, to experience physical calm, to fly higher, to go to space. It took generations, but the first Gotin flew amongst the stars, if only for a few minutes. This only fueled their desire, and within thirty cycles they'd landed on one of their two moons. In seventy cycles, a colony was established on the same moon, now they looked further. What else were they missing? Why couldn't they see anyone else out there? How far could they go? How fast? 450 cycles later, and a prototype FTL engine was produced. All that was left was to test it. Status. Core stable, engine warmed, FTL pre-checks complete, cooling functions, backups on standby. Life support steady, emergency rations and supplies verified, all hell penetration sealed, bay doors locked. Verified communication to base, escort craft as short range comms, all systems running smoothly. Blooded course is clear of traffic, sensors indicate empty space except for another phantom rock approximately 35,000 miles out. It's 10,000 miles from the test palm path. Path forward is clear. The captain looked pleased. After all, this was a big moment for everyone. Conditions couldn't be better, and if anything short of a catastrophic failure occurred, the escort ships could have everyone form the life pod. The Phantom Rock was a little unsettling, but those things showed up on the sensors from time to time. No one's ever hit one, and they disappear after a few seconds. The commentary is a faulty sensor or a space dust. Very well. Let this be a resounding success, or an experience to learn from, but do not let this be a failure. Aye, aye, Captain. Maneuvering, take us to cruising speed. Start the FTL engine when ready. Aye, aye, Captain. The Captain sat fastened to his harness, as did the rest of the small crew. Excitement, fear, joy, curiosity, but most of all anticipation filled the crew. The ship began to accelerate, and escort ships followed at a distance. The ship attained a cruising speed. The captain gripped the arms of the chair and leaned forward, waiting for the experimental engine to take over. He fought the urge to give the order. This was maneuvering's time for glory. 
They were professionals taking every safety precaution, and he wouldn't rush them. Khan maneuvering, answering cruising speed, starting the FTL engines. Maneuvering, Khan, aye. The hull shook as the FTL matched the cruising speed and the cruising engine was secured. The crew was pushed into their seats and the stars seemed to stretch into oval shapes. Navigation equipment began to freeze and the drastic change in information. Captain, they just entered FTL. No sign of damage. Escorts are following at sub-speeds. Understand all. Maintain cloak. Follow them to their destination. Inform the ambassador. The boarding crew is on standby. Aye, aye, Captain. Captain, navigation equipment is struggling with FTL travel as expected. At current estimated speed, we should arrive at the target location in 15 seconds. Very well, Nav. The navigation officer was yelling as the FTL speeds were deafening, when, in fact, the engine noise itself was only audible indication that it was functioning, and even that wasn't very loud. The captain didn't blame him, though. The entire control room was tense. Maneuvering, Con, take us out of FTL engine, answer all stop. All stop, Con, maneuvering, aye. The engine noise faded to silence, then returned to half of its intensity, now slowing the ship. Navigation equipment began to return as the ship exited FTL. The FTL engine then secured, followed by the cruising engine and slowing the ship to a stop. Con, maneuvering, the FTL engine is secured, answering all stop. Maneuvering, Con, aye. The captain released his harness and stood up, following the crews releasing their own harnesses. Status report. Call stable and returning to the lower power level. Engine is warmed, FTL engine is secured and indicating no faults. Life support is unaffected, hull maintained integrity, all hatches, bays and seals remain intact. Communication with base and escorts lost due to range. Equipment is fully functional. No damage. Navigation equipment restored. We overshot our target by 80,000 miles. Steering during FTL was unresponsive. It will take approximately 20 hours for the receiving escorts to reach us, and 16-day return trip if we use cruising engine. Understand all. Navigation, inform me when contact is established with escorts. Maneuvering, call the FDL, and prepare it for removal and return for inspection. Maintain cruising engine warm. Supply, coordinate meals and necessities for the two-week return trip. Make sure something's nice tonight for Silla. Captain, Phantom Rock 600 meters directly ahead and closing. The captain nearly fell over in shock. This is the closest the Phantom Rock has ever been to a spacecraft. The closest reporter was 4,000 miles. Captain, the rock is growing? The captain stopped seconds from ordering evasive maneuvers. The object was responding to them. How? Why now? 500 meters. It's still growing slightly. Maybe 70,000 tons of iron, or something lighter. 400 meters. It stopped growing. Approximately 100,000 tons of metal. It's sh shaped... Instruments say that the rock has straight edges. 300 meters. It stopped approaching, focusing the camera on projecting an image of the main screen. A massive hulk of flattened metal filled the screen. It was shaped like two triangles on top of each other, with a flat portion in the middle, housing several bay doors and large windows. Alien writing marked the site of drawing a female bipedal mammal holding what appeared to be a weapon was adorned behind it. It's a ship? It's an alien ship? The captain finally managed. The entire control room was silent. All right, pilot. No showing off. They're under a lot of stress right now. We don't need to startle them into doing anything foolish. The pilot didn't bother to tell the ambassador to go freck himself. This was his shuttle. He'd phoned it countless times without such smooth talk and telling him how to do his job. And he won't start now. The shuttle bay doors opened and the boarding shuttle departed from the Navy cruiser. The pilot was now white-knuckling the controls in a silent rage. But the ambassador didn't notice. He was concentrating on the mission. And this was his first time introducing the pre-contact species to the universe. And he didn't want to mess it up. Captain, a bay door is opening. The alien ship opened the bay door and released a single shuttle. Box-like and adorned with weapons on the sides, top and bottom. 
Stay calm, everyone. The main ship guns aren't yet pointed at us. We don't know what they want. The captain let out a curse under his breath. Even if they did mean to harm the crew, there was nothing that they could do about it. There wasn't a single weapon on board or amounted to the ship. Running was worthless at such close range, and the escorts couldn't scratch the thing even if they weren't over 120,000 miles away. Navigation sent a message to the escorts explaining the situation. Already done, sir. If this is first contact, I don't want it to be done through a camera. Open up the viewing shutter. Aye, aye, sir. As the shuttle approached the thick shutter at the nose of the alien ship, to the side to reveal a thick glass window and a control room, inhabited by the native species humans had been monitoring for the last three hundred years. Drive carefully now, they're watching us. Don't want them thinking you can't fly. That's all it took. The pilot depressed an impact warning button, a common warning for his crew to stay strapped in place. Then the shuttle veered away from the nose of the ship and accelerated. The pilot was grinning and giddy as the ambassador panicked and begged for the passenger's seat. Meanwhile, the shuttle was passing within a few feet of the eddied ship and came back around to do back to front. It ended up with a little spin in front of the nose and the pilot stopped at leveling the shuttle, turned the impact warning off and turned to face his shaking passenger, grin still at his face. Don't want them thinking I can't fly, sir. The ambassador had no response. He's first focused on getting his breathing back under control. All right, boys, we're here. Get out there and make your parents proud. With that radio transmission, the back of the shuttle opened and two sailors in suits left the shuttle with a peculiar item in their possession. What was that? A show of force? No, Nav. I believe it was a greeting. The captain moved in silence as his navigation and supply officers were debating the erratic shuttle movements. He stopped just in front of the viewing screen, watching the human shuttle, and two beings exited in suits. The room once again grew silent, and they watched these two beings bring a thin metal sheet closer to them. When they landed on the viewing window, everyone but the captain jumped back. Then they held up the metal directly in front of it. Why did it look so familiar? Captain, sir, is is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? The captain was genuinely curious. The navigation operator speaking was young and came from a tribe with jet black fur, an adaptation from living primarily on a charred mountains between plates, not a genetic adaptation, but cultural, achieved with dyes. The operator was usually quite reserved and had absurd climbing skills due to his tribe, but always hid his more educated and, well, nerdy behavior from his crew and family. The captain knew this and decided to play along as if he believed him, just as the rest of the crew did. However, now, as the operator's thirst for random facts may prove advantageous. Um, Captain, sir, I think that's a launched helix. The captain's eyes widened as he realized he was right. Hundreds of years ago, satellites were launched in all directions and wideband communications always broadcasting and a sheet of engraved metal, all meant for contacting intelligent life. Many of them had gone dark over the decades, and it looks like these aliens have captured one. Captain, sir, I'm picking up a low-frequency broadcast from the shuttle. It has a directional pattern straight at us. I believe it's audio. Play it over the one MC. Find me a way to return the signal. Aye, aye, Captain. A few seconds of feedback over the one MC makes the entire crew cringe for a second followed by a few seconds of static noise. Then, a robotic voice echoes throughout the silent ship. Greetings, experimental ship of the Goatine. Congratulations on achieving faster than light travel. We've been waiting for you to make a jump ever since we found your beacon in the dark, and watched with anticipation as you developed a colony on your moon. If you can hear this message, wave back to the sailors outside your ship. As the transmission ended, the two suits started to move their arms back and forth at them. The captain stood frozen for a moment before returning the foreign gesture. The suits stopped and one clenched his fist with his thumb pointed up. The captain was not sure if he expected alien life to be like, but this was vastly different ships, gestures and flying styles. It took a lot of effort just to keep him calm. The transmission then continued. We are the human race and you are not alone. We will watch and protect you as needed, and allow you to continue to develop on your own technology, just as we did. We have so much more to discuss. 
We'll follow you back to your world and get introduced properly. End of story. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please consider subscribing. If you wish to support the author, there is a link to the original story, so pop over there and give him your support. If you wish to support this channel, however, there are a few ways to do so. The best and easiest would be to share this video with other people, as well as liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All of these things tell the algorithm that this channel is at least vaguely interesting and that may share it with other people. If you wish to support the channel in some other manner, watching my other videos would also help tremendously. Or if you really, really, really like, there is a link down below to leave a tip or to join the Patreon. Any and all support is very much appreciated. And I hope that you all have a good one until the next time. And I'll see you then. Cheers.